is drawn It's all in black and white Hope is pulling forward And fear from behind It's time It's time to make a move So what will you decide? The clock is ticking on Don't let it pass you by It's time Good morning, Rise Church. So good to be with you again and to worship the Lord together in the beauty of His holiness, as the psalmist declared. We get an opportunity this morning to do just that. So let's press in. Um, Let's lift Him up for He is good, for His love endures forever. He is worthy of all praise. We're going to sing in a few few moments uh, of these 10,000 reasons that my heart could find to worship the Lord. And so right now, why don't you just take a moment to just consider the faithfulness of God in your life and His beauty and His awesome power. And let's worship, let's respond together uh, to His goodness.
Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, Amen. Well, thank you, Pete. Good morning, everyone. Welcome in the name of Jesus. So glad that you joined us. We're going to be in James chapter 1. Really looking forward to it, but let's pray at this time. Lord, I pray for everyone hearing this message and studying your word you would give them ears to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to them. Thank you that your word is always a healing word, an encouraging word, a rescuing word. We pray, Lord, if there's anyone who doesn't know you, is hearing this message, their eyes would be open. They would embrace you as Savior and Lord. This would be the greatest day of their life. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. James chapter 1, we're going to jump right in. The title of the message is, It's Better to Reject the Bait Than Struggle with the Hook. Here we are, James 1. This is, I think, our fifth message, verse by verse. We're going to begin in verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone with evil. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Okay. And then he says in verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So let's get a little running start. One of the unique things that took place for our family while we were kind of locked down in COVID a few months ago was my grandfather's goggles that he wore as a Navy pilot were discovered in their original box. Open it up, there's his goggles, and there's a bunch of lenses that he had. Of course, uh, as I've said before, he was a, a squadron leader, and he was preparing men, he's preparing himself to protect our country. It was right on the eve, actually, of war with Japan. Long story short, he was a fighter pilot. He needed to see clearly because there were life and death issues at play. Today, we need to see clearly. There are life and death issues at play, and that means we need the right lens to see not only the past, but the present, the future, our lives, the opposite sex, what's taking place in our life. And it all begins with either putting on the lens of supernaturalism, which means there's a God, first mover of all things, a mind behind creation, or naturalism, which means basically we all came from mindless nature. It's either God created us or nothing created us. And Adam Kurtz said this, he said, for the best atheists uh, agree with the best defenders of the faith on one crucial point, that the choice to believe or disbelieve existentially is the most important choice of all. It shapes one's whole understanding of human life and purpose because it is the choice that each of us must make for him or herself. Whoa. Well, it's not really a woe to me. I get it. But it's like, okay, you either got the lens of supernatural naturalism has huge impact. Watch this. If I embrace naturalism, if I put the lens of naturalism on, I'm basically saying, we came from nothing, we are nothing, and we are headed nowhere. That has a profound impact on how I view life, I view myself, I view others. It's why, and it explains why atheist Frederick Nietzsche said that basically humans are merely animals. Well, why? Because we came from nothing, we are nothing, we're headed nowhere. We're created by mindless nature. It's why the famous psychologist of Harvard University, B.F. Skinner said, that basically humans are just machines. It's why, and it explains why. Uh, Hitler took the positions that he was, that he had, fueled by Darwinian evolution. You know, we think of Darwin, we think of his book, The Origin of Species, right? But that wasn't the whole title. The title was The Origin of Species, get this, by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Okay, Darwin wrote, according to the laws of natural selection, the European race will emerge as the distinct species, homo sapiens, all transitional forms, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, the Negro, the Australian Aborigine will be extinguished in the struggle. 
Hitler was highly influenced. Came from nothing. We are nothing. We're a bunch of animals. Survival of the fittest. He believed in a supreme race. Of course, uh, extreme Islamics believe in extreme faith, destruction before there's wholeness under their false messiah. But it was Hitler who said, why should I not be crueler than nature? Naturalism lens, naturalism lens. Naturalism leads you down a self-defeating, destructive path. And later, Viktor Frankl, a Nazi Holocaust survivor, blamed all the horror of the Holocaust on those who truly believed in their atheistic, naturalistic, mindless nature worldview. Look, if there is no God, there is no moral authority to identify what is right and wrong. Uh, But of course, if as the evolutionary scientists say, we're a byproduct of mindless nature, then morality, love, beauty are not real but merely a set of chemical reactions in our bodies. That's their position. If that's the case, why even believe them? Because they're proposing something that is driven by chemicals. It eats itself. It's self-defeating. Why am I beginning this way? Because there's heavy issues, very weighty issues James is addressing here. And I want us to see an immediate contrast. Please look at verse 27 of chapter 1. James writes, half-brother of Jesus, inspired by the Spirit, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans, widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Oh, uh, now we put on naturalism. God created us. Every human being has intrinsic value. Therefore, if there's weakness, if there's vulnerability, be responsible as a fellow human, create an image of God, and love people and care for them. So if you have widows, if you have those Uh, orphans, support them. And then, of course, keep oneself unspotted from the world. Chapter 2, check it out. My brother, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, with partiality, Lord of glory, weight, value, truth. Okay, you, you believe in God. In other words, I'll paraphrase this. Treat everybody with value. Do not show special favoritism to people because they are materially blessed or they look a certain way or of a certain ethnicity. Stop it. That is like, that's wrong. That's a form of evil. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right on. Hey, listen, like Hitler's not going to take that view. Nietzsche's not going to take that view. Uh, If your neighbor is, um, you know, deemed a lesser of the race, you're not going to treat them with value. I mean, you know, of course we come from the, we're all of one race, the human race. Okay. So again, naturalism, getting back to Nietzsche, getting back to B.F. Skinner, getting back to Hitler, crazy stuff. The Bible, of course, identifies God created, created us in his image. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then, and then check it out in verse nine. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, you're convicted by the law's transgressors for whoever shall keep the whole law. And it's still in one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, don't murder. In other words, value your fellow man, uh, respect original design of marriage, uh, esteem your neighbor, protect life, love it. And in chapter two, verse 19, You believe there's one God? Okay, now we're getting to supernaturalism here. You do well, right on. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. In other words, you have a a supernaturalistic view, supernaturalism, the the lens of a true living God. Okay, hold that faith, that truth, by demonstrating righteousness and justice towards others. Here's point number one. We have a moral responsibility and obligation to believe responsibly, okay? Has a huge impact on what we believe. And, and, and just at the very outset, we need to ensure we have a supernaturalism view or lens on. And we need to believe responsibly. This was James. Okay, context. Verse 1, James. A bondservant, another chief allegiance is God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's writing to Jews amidst the Diazipporah. James 
um, was responsible in what he believed. You know, he was the half-brother of Jesus. He didn't always believe his half-brother of Jesus was the Messiah. But he let truth dictate his belief. He let the facts speak for himself. And he became convinced of the resurrection of Jesus. And as a result, he followed Jesus as Lord, as Messiah. And it could be said he embodied the very message that he's pinning here. Because in verse 12, we talked about this a couple weeks, blessed is the man who endures temptation, trials and temptation. But when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you know James was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple for his allegiance? He had the right lens of supernatural, right lens that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, he was persecuted for that, but he knew that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He knew it. He knew the most important value of life was the Lord himself, the Savior, the Lord, the Messiah, the Davidic King. And that was more important than his life. He, was, he persevered. No doubt the Lord put a crown of life upon his head and he's going to rule and reign. We're going to rule and reign with all the saints one day. Okay, running start. That's it. Context. James identifying two main teaching moments in life. Trials, adversity, hardship, and now temptation. And how we can be an overcomer when it comes to trials and temptations. Now, we get to temptations, which is different than trial. We're going to unpack that the more. But look at verse 13. James immediately dispels misinformation that's critical to overcoming temptation. Temptation is the idea of enticement. There's bait, but the bit, in the bait, there's a hook. And it's just critical. You turn from the bait, then you struggle with the hook that leads to death. And he says in verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. In other words, God's not going to entice you to step outside of original design, to step outside of the will of God, to step outside of that which is right. God does not tempt anyone. Heard a story about a guy, he was battling with his weight. You know, we've all been there. And so he needed to eat properly, get some exercise. His downfall was Krispy Kreme donuts, right? And the th problem is, is like when he was off to work and he'd come home, he had to drive by Krispy Kreme. So he decided, I'm, not, I'm just going to take an alternative route. He did that for three weeks. He's doing great. He's not down, you know, loading these Krispy Kreme donuts. And so like after three weeks, he goes to work and he has five boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts, two of which <laughs> had been eaten. And his co-workers like, man, you blew it. You need to get back and do what's right. He said, you guys, this is so different. These Krispy Kreme donuts are different. Ate two boxes, brought some for you. This is different because I had forgot. I drove by, saw Krispy Kreme, uh, and, and there was a line on. And so they were making fresh Krispy Kreme donuts. And so I said, Lord, you know, if you just want to bless me, because I kind of forgot about this whole thing, but I've been doing good, and I'll get back and do what's right. But if, if you want to bless me, you know, may there be an a open parking space right in the front of the store. And he said, after I had gone around the block eight times, there it was. Ah, temptation succumbing to it. Usually we talk ourselves into bad decisions. We'll get to that a little bit. But the point is this. Okay, this is point number two. God does not entice anyone to sin. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. And on a more serious note, getting from Krispy Kreme, don't, Krispy Kreme donuts, other issues, to be tempted is to imply there is a line that can be crossed to sin or to do evil. And that raises larger issues. Namely, God created us with the ability to make choices. God did not create evil. He created the possibility of evil by giving us freedom. Evil is nothing more than the corruption of that which God intended for good. It's logically impossible to, for him, God, to create a world in which people have genuine freedom, yet the potential, yet without the potential to do uh, what is depraved or even evil. If God has created us without freedom, 
we would have a world without humans and a world without law. That's a lot there, but important perspectives, I'm sure you got it. And there's more because God has given us this internal law called the conscience that accuses or excuses our actions. And he has given revelation of himself in the person of his son who came and gave his life on the cross saying there's brokenness. Man has taken the liberty and the choice that God has given him too far, stepped outside of original design, set man in a trajectory never intended by God. Jesus came to rescue us from ourselves as well as many other things. You know, after World War II, Germany, of course, uh, had lost the war. And, uh, and the Nazi leaders, these evil Nazi leaders, were put on trial at Nuremberg. Their defense was, hey, you have to judge us based upon our laws. Kind of generalize it. Get back to the Hitlerian, Darwinian influence craziness, right? We believe we're the superior race. That's what our leader said. That's what our laws uh, indicated, okay? So therefore, we had the right, you know, in the name of evolution, generalizing here, to go swallow up what we saw as the weaker race. The chief prosecutor from the United States, Robert Jackson, appealed to permanent transcultural values. He appealed to a law beyond the law, a universal law, laws that cannot merely rest in finite world. Otherwise, there's no basis to say Nazis were wrong. Again, being enticed to violate one's conscience and God's revelation of himself is not God's fault. James writes, for God cannot be tempted by evil. There is evil. There is original design one can step out of. I can violate my conscience and violate the Ten Commandments. I can violate the allegiance of the Lord Jesus. That steps out of original design. That sets a trajectory never intended by God. Again, context, James chapter 1, which actually, as I mentioned, is addressing two main issues, trials and, and uh, temptations, is really the chief theme throughout the book. Okay, but there's a difference between trials and temptations. However, here's point number three. Trials, adversity, hardship, falling into the potholes of life, which can happen at any time, any place. Okay, we fall into trials, can actually lead to temptations. And we see this in specific ways in the early church that we can learn by. Here's what I mean by it. Watch. The trial of persecution or pushback or injustice towards a believer, okay, can lead to the temptation to then step away from a responsibility to the greater good within the body of Christ. The Hebrew writer says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhort one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. In other words, the Hebrews that the Hebrew writer is writing to were actually being persecuted for their faith. That led to a temptation to step away from uh, being a part of the counterculture to culture, the church, forsaking fellowship. As a result, not only did it have an, an, un, an adverse impact upon that individual, but the church as a whole wasn't strengthened as God intended. Look, we're needless to say amidst a unique time, okay? But I would encourage you that this trial, this pandemic does not turn to a temptation that you would step away as a believer from the whole, from the good, from the church. Every believer, listen, every believer hearing my voice, I would encourage you in the name of Jesus, in the name of scripture, okay? Be consistent to your local church, either in person on a weekly basis or online participating as you are. So proud of you, great job but we are not to forsake the fellowship of our brethren. That can be a temptation amidst persecution or trials. Also, the trial of being marginalized, peer pressure, feeling the minority can lead to the temptation of discouragement and therefore you just feel like giving up. It's not like denying Jesus, but it's like, it's really like giving up and following him like I should. That was a temptation of the early church. The counter is, for consider him who endured such hostility, the Lord Jesus said it, from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Oh man, keep your eyes on Jesus, who kept his eyes on the heavenly Father. 
Hey, the trial of relational conflict. You know, oh man, relational conflict in the family, at work. Okay, watch this. Trial. Okay, fall into it. Didn't think it was happening, but it happened. I can't believe it. I'm in it. That can lead to a temptation of not forgiving that can lead, therefore, to bitterness. And bitterness is like unresolved relational baggage that undermines one's ability to move forward. It's a poison that one administers to oneself. And the Bible says, Hebrews 12, 15, lest any root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and by this many become defiled. You can see a trial, okay, which is like adversity, oppression, circumstantial, can actually potentially lead to an enticement. These are some of the ways we need to keep our guard up. Here's point number four. Trials, okay, are like potholes. Boom, fall into them. Temptation is a process. Temptation is an enticement. Promises pleasure, promises gain, but it leads to pain, erosion, death. And this means that no one falls overnight. No one wakes up and just says, you know what? I think I'm going to be unhealthy today. Or I think I'm going to like be an addict today. Or I think I'm going to get arrested today. I think I'm going to ruin my family today. No, you have to talk yourself into bad decisions. It's a process. And it speaks to the fact that we can actually be our worst enemy. Uh, and to to be and to the propensity of humans actually to deceive ourselves. We can be a worse enemy. We can deceive ourselves. And that tells us that the Lord came to rescue us from ourselves. James is identifying the, one of the keys to ensure that we are rescued. And that is he identifies this process of temptation. It's actually a fivefold process. So let's look at here in verse 13 down to verse 15. Number one. All right, watch this. Let no one say when he is tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted. Okay, now, this is the bait stage. Okay, okay. Temptation that ultimately can lead to death if given into. Okay, starts with bait, some allurement, some enticement. Okay, so what bait are we talking about? The bait to look, the bait to think, the bait to fear, the bait to lie. The bait to be distracted, the bait to be embittered. Um, hey, what bait presents itself to you? What enticement seems to come your way? Because, you know, what is bait for one person may not be to another. It's a lure. It's an enticement to move you outside of God's will, outside of original design. What is it for you? Um, it's important to identify. It could be a variety of things. And of course, it can be seasonal. But at this stage, when the bait presents itself, there's no sin. In fact, it's not a sin to be tempted. Uh, it's not a sin to feel some enticement or that to know that enticement exists. Okay, there's still a way out. S uh, sin is knocking on the door. The bait is like trying to allure you. Ultimately, it's a sin to give in to it, okay? But we'll get to that in just a little bit. But what it tells us is this. Okay, when we're tempted, whatever it may be, to look, to think, to be embittered, to not forgive, uh, to lie, to cheat, wherever it may be, we have a choice. You know, it, it's been said, I can't, you know, control whether a bird flies over my head, but I can't control whether that bird builds a nest on my head. Ultimately, we have a choice and God has set before us life and death. We're to choose life. At this stage, it's important. When that bait presents itself, I'm not going to respond. I'm going to turn away. Very important to turn from the bait immediately than to struggle with the hook. But it tells us at this stage, you want to make sure you do that because small compromises are big. If you don't turn immediately from the bait, you give room to the devil. Yeah, you give a foothold that can become a stronghold and turning from the bait consistently, whether it's to lie, whether it's to look, whether it's to think a certain, whether it's fear, that's a godly habit. And that has a big impact upon our souls and our spirit, has a big impact upon even our, bo our body, our mind. Scientists are learning that the brain actually has grooves in it that come from repeated thinking. 
And that is why a thought becomes an action. An action becomes a habit. A habit becomes a pattern, a behavior that is almost automatic. Thoughts, like drops of water, seek the path of least resistance. Thoughts do not edit themselves. They go with the flow, as it were, and are attracted to thoughts that are like them, if you will. So, watch. Bait presents itself. Turn away from that bait. Man, much much easier to turn from the bait than ultimately to struggle with the hook. Now watch, here's step number two. All right, you're drawn away by your own desires. All right, now you're showing a little interest, maybe taking the idea on a test drive. Step number three, you're almost took drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. Now you're kind of thinking it through, you're rationalizing it, you're processing, you're considering it. Step number four, uh, verse 15, the hook is now set. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then, and then what does sin produce when it's fully grown? It brings forth what? Blessings in relationships? Blessing in uh, your marriage? Blessing when it comes to your dreams? Blessing when it comes to your inner life? No. What's, what started as, as this as conception has now full-blown, setting you in a trajectory God never intended. That brings death. It's just like, you know, self-defeating. Uh, hurtful of you, hurtful to other people, dishonoring to God. Now, I want to encourage you in some things. <laughs> Words of healing and hope and freedom. Because we just looked at like the anatomy of of temptation. It's a process. You know, taking the deception out of uh, temptation. Words of hope and healing, okay? Remember, one of the reasons the Lord came is to deliver us from ourselves. Know this. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9. Can I hear a big amen to that? And I love Psalm 32, 5. If you fail, then confess your sin. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Okay, watch. If you have not turned from the bait, if you have been enticed in an area of sin and uh, that leads to death, okay, self-defeating, destructive, okay, death to dreams, death to inner life, death to relationship. If that is taking place, Confess your sins. Okay, agree with God with regard to that and afresh receive his forgiveness and the fact that as a child of God, you're not only cleansed, but you have a different identity. And this leads us to the cross. Confess. Also realize that the cross, Jesus not only paid the debt of our sin, which is separation from God's death, but he gave us power over sin. Okay, so think of it this way. Think of like your life like an oak tree, okay, rooted so strongly. But there's this vine that is growing around it, you know, your life. And, and that vine that is potentially restrictive, let's just say, is, is sin. At the cross, Jesus took an axe to the root of that vine. That vine speaks of habits, behaviors contrary to the will of God, okay, in mind and in action. He took an axe to it. Sin does not have power over you. Okay, you say, okay, oh, sometimes I just feel like, man, temptation's huge. I, I just, I, I know I feel my weakness. Get it. But in Christ, due to what Jesus accomplished on the cross, he has given us power in his resurrection by the Holy Spirit over sin. And the Bible says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reckon yourself to be dead. Also can be translated, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Take these words seriously. The word reckon is logizomizo, which means assessing, thinking deeply upon it, calculating new identity. Jesus paid the debt of my sin. He took my sin upon himself, the world sin upon himself. In his resurrection, in his life, we have power to live as God called us to. We're in process. None of us are perfect. You know, you got that 
vine, you know, the root has been cut. You feel sometimes the vine, we feel restriction. It needs to be rid of, it needs to die. We need to experience full liberty in Christ. We're in process. That's why it's important if we sin, we confess, we lay hold of the victory we have at the cross. And you know, sometimes it's just good to say this. You know, bitterness presents itself, I'm dead to that. Some type of lust, I'm dead to that. Some type of slander, I'm dead to that. Some type of temptation, lie, I'm dead to those things. And remember, look, we need each other. We need each other. That's why I just want to get back. Okay, church family and friends, be committed to your home church, whether online or in person, on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis. We need each other, okay? It's like the church is like a barbecue pit. Right, and all the believers are like like coals in a barbecue pit, and we benefit from each other. Okay, we feed off of each other, and as a result, we're hot in our love for the Lord and our pursuit of the Lord. But if we isolate ourselves from the church, from the barbecue pit, we grow cold. Isolation, avoid it. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Listen, the most important choice you could ever make is the choice to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. There's no middle ground. He said, there's a broad way that leads to destruction. Many go that way. A narrow way that leads to eternal life. Few be that find it. Okay. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Please hear me. Don't isolate yourself. You know, don't say, well, you know what? This is my life. You know, I'm an island to myself. Stop that. You were created by God. You're not a byproduct of mindless nature. And there's a God in heaven who has revealed himself. And how beautiful is that? And he's inviting you into relationship. Truth of the matter is, that is the missing piece in your life. You know, a long time ago, well, not too long ago, a couple decades ago, there was a song popular when I was in high school, A Hole in My Life, written by the band Police. I have a hole in my life. It makes me vulnerable. I hate this disease. Hey, listen, that hole, that, that absence, that emptiness uh, is really a relationship with God. In other words, that exists because something is fundamentally off. Okay, Jesus came to bridge the gap between God and man. The core problem with man, separation, sin. He came to make it right. Okay, to bring right allegiance, because if that's right, everything on the horizontal level is right. He loves you. He loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. So hear that. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He wants your highest good. And you know what that is ultimately? is Him. And Jesus said He stands at the door and knocks, and if anyone would hear His voice, open the door, He will come in. And as He does, He brings forgiveness of your sin. He brings hope beyond the grave. He brings His presence in your life. Now you are a child of the Heavenly Father, okay? Serious business here, very serious. Please hear me. Go back to the original point. Supernatural. God created with intent, with purpose. There's a plan. There's a purpose of man. Okay, or what? Mindless nature. We came from nothing. We are nothing. We're headed nowhere. Okay, that's a lie. Follow the truth. Jesus is the truth. And he demonstrated by resurrecting from the dead. And you know what? Here's the thing. In an age where we, there's a lot of social dynamic and terrible racism, which is just, just disgusting, the reality is this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Big, small, black, white. Jesus has created a community made of every tribe, tongue, and nation. He is creating a, a kingdom that will never break down. The Bible says all nations ultimately will break down as they have throughout history, but the kingdom Jesus is building will never break down. He wants you to be a citizen of it today. Will you or will you isolate yourself? Will you embrace him or will you walk away from him? Will you worship him as king or will you dismiss him? Listen, it's either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He's either the Lord, as he claimed, he's some stinking liar, which is crazy to take the position, or he's a lunatic, no evidence for that. He is Lord. And and the wisest thing you could ever do is embrace him as your Lord and Savior. 
He really is just a prayer away. Say, what do you mean? Number one, recognize what he's done for you. He made you, he created you, revealed himself. Jesus gave himself on the cross, demonstration of love. No man has greater love than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. He laid his life down, demonstration he loves you. He paid the debt of sin, bridged the gap between God and man. He's reaching out to you. Three days later, he resurrected from the dead. He's coming again. I recognize it. I believe it. Number two, I need to repent. You turn in life, follow him. No one's perfect. He'll give you the strength to follow him, but it all begins by opening your heart to him. Number three, he is just a prayer away. Those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. You can do that in the next few moments. I'd love to lead you in a word of prayer. Do it now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Hey, if you'd like to receive Christ, and step into this. I'm praying for you in my heart. I'm thinking of you. You know, I, 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 you know in this moment, through technology, it can happen. I, I encourage you, pray. Now, call upon him. If you'd like to receive Christ, you'd like to know for sure your sins are forgiven. If you were to die, you'd go to heaven. That can be settled. Open your heart to him. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, just call upon him. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in you. You gave your life on the cross resurrected from the dead. I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a great Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Lord, come into my life. Fill me with the life of God. Teach me to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for making me your child both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. Here's what I want you to do. On our website, risesanmarcos.com, on the front page, there's a button, I prayed to receive Christ. Go to it immediately. Click on it because it identifies now the next steps of how to grow as a Christian. Okay, so important to identify. So I just want to like lead you right to our website, risesanmarcos.com. Click I prayed to receive Christ, steps of how to grow as a Christian. And if you'd like us to send you a new believer's Bible, we'd be glad to do it. Just fill out the information there. Congratulations. If you're in North County, we'd love for you to be a part of Rise uh, San Marcos, Rise Church San Marcos. We're meeting in person. We're outside, actually. 9 a.m., outside service, singing, worshiping the Lord, having a wonderful time. But we're going to also be continuing our services online. So come back. And, and, and be a part of the church on a weekly basis. And congratulations. Um, go online there. And, I, and by the way, if you fill out that information, it, it allows us to know you receive Christ. And I'd love to even personally contact to help you in any way as grow as a believer. God bless you. You guys, we're going to transition a little bit. Worship the Lord a little different way. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Thank you, church family, for being consistent, honoring the Lord in this way. Needless to say, crazy time. But the work continues. The work continues in his name. So let's pray. Lord, be blessed with this giving to you. We give in the name of Jesus. And Lord, again, multiply these monies. Raise up the body of believers that rise in a big way. Work in depth and breadth, as well as the revival throughout uh, North County and California and the world in Jesus' name. Awaken your church. Use these monies to your glory. Lord, blow our minds with your muscle and your might during this unique time. We pray for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you'd like to give, super easy. RiseSanMarcos.com. There's a button on the right-hand side. Totally safe and secure. Thank you for honoring the Lord in this way. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Make his beautiful face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Raise up his countenance in your life and give you a bunch of peace. I mentioned that we are meeting in person, outside, social spacing, safe and secure, as best as we possibly can be, 9 a.m. at Rice San Marcos, but also, of course, continue our services here online. Thank you for joining us. We love you. Stephanie and I are praying for you. We'll see you next week. It's time to make a move, so what will you decide? The clock is ticking on, don't let it pass you by, it's time. It's time.
Draw your sword, let's be the resistance, oh Lord, oh Lord. 